Father, we thank you in this house, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you brought some thirsty people into this house tonight, Lord. You brought some hungry people into this house, Father. And Lord, we thank you, Father, that no matter what it is that we're going through, no matter the resistance that we're feeling, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, because we know you're faithful. We know you're faithful, Lord. We know, Father, that, that you love us so much that you gave your son, Jesus, that we might have life. But as we straggle into this place, after the Passover, we, we straggle in with resistance, Father. And so, Lord, I just ask you, Father, to break the resistance in this house tonight, Lord. Father, break the spiritual resistance yes, God. that is in the realms right now, all over the world, Father. There is resistance. And, Father, we just thank you, Lord. There are people that want to be here tonight that are under so much resistance that they are unable even to come or unable even to hear your word or get into your word, Lord. They're unable to sit in that quiet place with you because they feel so much resistance. And I hear the Lord saying that people are so thirsty and so hungry, but they don't even know how thirsty and hungry they are because all they sense is resistance. And when we sense that, sometimes we don't know that it's, it's God that wants to take us beyond that and into that place where he can feed us and he can give us the water that we need. And so we're just going to stand together in faith right now. We're going to break the resistance in this house right now. I want everybody to lift up your hands in this place. We're going to break resistance. Father, I praise you and I thank you, Lord. Though the enemy has set up a garrison against us, Lord, we will smite with your sword, Lord. And that garrison will fall, and we will step into the place that you have promised us, Lord. Father, we thank you that when you make a promise, it shall come to pass. But resistance is evidence of the promise. And so feed our souls tonight. Give us the water that we need. Give us the food that we need, that we can keep on going. And we all say together, amen. amen. Now, why was that prayer so important? Because if you are feeling like you can't get to the next place that God said you're going to have with your new mantles and new assignments, it's because there is resistance that has come against the word that has been spoken over your life. And what happened at Passover, which opened up the doors, the doors for you to step into these new mantles and these new assignments. Thank you. And so, now this is totally biblical for this time of year, and I'm going to show you that in the word. But what happens after Passover or after we celebrate Resurrection Sunday is those spiritual forces come in so intently to push back any of the uh, assignment or any of, any of the joy, any of the excitement that we had about the assignment and the new anointings that God has given us. And it makes us question what's happening. It makes us slow down. It makes us get groggy and slothful. Does anybody feel that way? But that's a real thing. This is a real spiritual thing, and I'm going to show you in the Word of God how this happens. So what we do as a church, the church stands together then, and they pray, and resistance is broken. But until the church comes to a place of even recognizing what its need is for the fulfillment of the purpose, then the church itself can't even ask God to come and do what he needs to do. So that's what we did tonight. We, we came into worship and prayer, and we said, God, I believe you and you're faithful. Now help me to get rid of the slothfulness, and get rid of um, a whatever resistance is holding me back from what you promised me. Can I get an amen? 
Okay, so tonight's message is no more chains. No more chains. I'm going to give a comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament tonight so you can actually see what happened after Passover uh, in the book of Exodus. We know that Passover is Exodus chapter 12, but in Exodus chapter 13, God began to move the Israelites into the promised land. So they had the Passover, they killed the lamb, put the lamb's blood on the doorpost, ate the lamb inside the house. Overnight, they locked themselves in, and then they began to be released. And God said, We're, I'm going to take you quickly to the place that I've called you, but not without resistance. Because who is there that came after him? Pharaoh. Right? And, and their cry became, let my people go. Let my people step into the destiny that I have for them. And you can read about that yourself in Exodus chapter 13. But I'm going to take you to verse 17. The word says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Oh, come on. You thought it was easy. You thought when God said you had a new mantle and a new assignment, you're just going to walk right into that thing. No. No, see, he knew you might change your mind and turn back and say, Egypt looked better. But I'm here to tell you, no, God said, let my people go and let them step into the place that I have for them. But it requires a battle. And how do we fight the war? We fight the war with worship, with praise, with standing with our sword, with um, our, our armor on. From Ephesians chapter 6, that's how we fight the good fight of faith. Now listen, anytime God says, I promoted you, there's always resistance to prove the promotion. But the fact of the matter is, in the book of Exodus, though they were promoted, they went straight into the desert after that. Though following the God who loved them and made every ounce of provision for them in the very desert that he took them to. Now let me just fast forward a little bit because I want you to understand that, that though um, we have Exodus chapter 12 where the Passover takes place, Exodus 13 through uh, chapter 13 through chapter 18 is their desert journey. Well, what happens during that, that desert journey, that period of time? Well, we actually have a few things. Uh, in Exodus 16, they start complaining because there's no food. And God said, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. I'm, I'm going to give you some manna from heaven and some quail. I got gotcha. you. And then they get to 17, and they start complaining because there ain't no water. These are thirsty and hungry folk. Look to your neighbor and say, I think I understand where she's going with this. See, you can feel in the spiritual realm that there's a battle before you and you're thirsty and you're hungry. Well, why? Because in Exodus, that's what they're going through as they're headed to the place that God says they're going to possess. They're going to occupy and then possess. So then, in, in Exodus chapter 18, Moses is getting a little tired. He's been leading the people, and he's a little sick of the complaining. And he sits at, at, as a judge, listening to everybody's complaint, one right after another. And his father-in-law, Jethro, says, oh, Son, son, you're going to kill yourself. You've got to stop taking every complaint and having it come directly to you. Like, like you've got to get some men together that... Uh, are sound, they're sound with their families, they're sound in their mind, um, they're, they're good disciples, he didn't use the word disciple, but, but nonetheless they are ones that are good followers and they believe in a vision, and let the complaints come to them, let only a few make, make their way up to the top, because I got a plan for you and you can't sit there all day long listening to that, 
And Moses took Jethro's advice, and it was a good thing. And then when they hit Exodus 19, that happens in the month of Sivan, and that is when the Torah is given on Mount Sinai. That's when God comes and he brings them the commandments. And so, and it's also Shavuot, that's right. And we're going to be coming into that, Pentecost. The Feast of Shavuot and Pentecost is going to happen in June 8th and 9th. Okay, so why is this relevant? Because the, the next month on the calendar year, the Hebrew calendar, is the month of ER. And that happens on Monday. And so that's a stepping in to the new month. See, we just, we're ending Nisan. We're ending all the Passover, but we're going into the month of ER. And that month is a month where you need to learn yourself how to break the chains in your life so you can drink the water and eat the food of God and still have the joy of the Lord in the midst of him taking you through to Sivan and Pentecost, Shavuot and Pentecost. So, so tonight I want to teach you some things about how to press through, about how to get to that place where you are an overcomer and you are victorious. And just because your body doesn't feel it, it's okay because their body didn't feel it either. See, when you're the people of God, and when you're the church of God, you stepped into a spiritual realm where you literally experience from a heavenly perspective what they did all those years ago. Does anybody understand that? See, you are part of the family of God, and we are grafted in to the plan in the New Testament, but we are still, because we're grafted in, we are part of the Old Testament roots. Now, this time of year in Israel, they recognize the desert experience. But if you this month experience the desert, you should be saying, I'm going to seek the heart of God with everything I've got so that I can understand how to drink and how to eat and I can keep my sustenance up for the journey. But we have to teach ourselves that. See, God was gracious to them. He gave them manna, quail, water. Now, the first time they hit the water, it was bitter, and they had to throw in a tree, and then it became sweet for them to drink. But there was one battle after another. Then they had people they had to battle. They had the ideas they had to battle along the way. It was not easy getting to the place. But what does Exodus chapter 23 tell us? And that goes all the way back to the beginning of Nisan. See, I am sending an angel before you to take you to the place that I have prepared. So if we talk about Exodus 13 all the way to 19, and we fast forward to 23, that word is still going out. See, there's an angel that is taking you to the place that I have prepared. He has not abandoned you. He has not left you for dead. He is still feeding you, and he's still giving you the water that you need. But you had to open yourself up for that water. And listen, I'm going to propose a challenge to you this month. That you get in that place with God, and you begin to cry out and say, Lord, show me this water. Show me this water from the rock. Lord, show me this food that comes from heaven that's going to feed me and sustain me on this journey. And then you know what's going to happen to you? In a month, you're going to be in revival when we start the Feast of Pentecost. If you give one month to God and give your heart to him and get on your face before him and start praying and get in that intercessory prayer room, Stop making excuses and get in there Wednesday night at 6 or Sundays at 9 o'clock and say, for one month, God, I'm going to give it to you because I need to, because spiritually, no matter what, I got to be an overcomer in the midst of this desert place that you have called me to. He's going to meet you, and then you're going to be on fire on June 9th when the calendar turns over, and then we go into... Pentecost and Shavuot. Now, I want to share with you some scriptures because until we understand the love of God, 
it's hard to recognize the fact that he would provide for us in such a desert place. See, see, God speaks out and he says, my child, I want to take you to this place. And I'm going to take care of you while you go there. But I need you to believe me. I need you to have faith and stay with me. I need you to fix your eyes on me and look at nothing but me. Not look at what is going on around you. Not look at the negativity. Don't listen to the lies. And keep your eyes on me. And I will get you through this desert experience and into the place that I have called you. Isaiah chapter 61, the word says, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is Jesus speaking. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, I'm going to challenge you. Do you really believe that Jesus came to set you free? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that he came to break the chains off the captives? If you really believe that, then you are somebody that he wants to use to break the chains off of somebody else. If you really believe that, then are you living your life as though you have no chains? I don't hear no amens. I don't hear no amens. Because Christians can be bound in their desert experience saying, God, how do I get out of this? I know that there's got to be some water somewhere. And they can feel very bound and very much in chains when things are not going the way they want them to. So I'm going to challenge you to read Isaiah 61 all the way through and meditate on it during this desert time. Why? If you begin to believe that he came to set the captives free, you'll get set free too. You can be set free in your spirit, man, but your soul can be all bound up. But if you rest in the love of God, you will not feel that binding at all. And you will then have the strength to get through the month. I'm prophesying to you because I'm telling you, this month, it's, this is happening. And if you don't put into practice what I'm telling you, you may not make it through the month the way you want to make it through the month. You'll be looking at it going, man, that was really tough and I had to push and press here. It doesn't have to be that bad. you got to feel some of it, but you're to feel some of it so that you go to the source who sustains you. See, for those of us who are Christians, we know our source. See, you can articulate your source, but do you know how to tap into your source? You can be logical about your source, and you can tell somebody else that he's your source, but do you know how to get from your source yourself? This is the month you got to reevaluate that. Psalm chapter 107 verse 13 says, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron. If you do not know how to get yourself free, then how's God going to use you to help get somebody else free? But see, if you want to see revival in your life and revival in the life of somebody else, then when you get set free, no matter how long you've been a Christian, when you get set free of whatever baggage you're carrying, you're going to be happy to tell the world that you've been set free. You're already a Christian. You're already going to heaven. But if you start wearing a smile on your face in the middle of the desert experience, because they're going to be feeling it too, everybody's going to say, that doesn't make no sense to me. Like, why are you all happy? Because he set me free. And they're going to say, well, well, are you sure he set me free too? Uh-huh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he set you free too. Did you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, yes, I did, but why do I feel all of this? 
Well, let me help you get out of your mess because I know how to get out of mine. See, that makes you somebody that's useful in the kingdom because you're spreading how to get yourself out of the mess. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 12 because this is tying in the New Testament. Oh. Hello. Hello. I got this. Yes, you do. Okay, so in case you missed it, what Pastor Candace is talking about is transformation. You want to know what real soul transformation is? Your body. That's the quickest and easiest way someone's going to see you're transformed. Because if this thing don't line up with what's going on inside of you, it's a worthless testimony. It's an incongruent testimony. She just mentioned it. Like if you're going through the desert and you're smiling, everyone's going to go, what's going on? How come you're smiling? This sucks. But until this lines up with what happened inside here, it's okay, but I'm just telling you, you, haven't, you, you don't understand transformation. And see, people get all wrapped up in the spiritual. I, I, I just want to focus on the spiritual. But if this doesn't line up with the spiritual, it's an incongruent testimony. I don't want what you got. I don't want your spiritualness if this doesn't line up with what the Word says. I want what you have if this aligns with what's gone on with what the Word says. I mean, here, here's a quiz. What did Jesus say is going to happen? Did he say, A, things are going to get really bad and, and people are going to freak out? Um, B, did Jesus say, um, if things get bad, you should just stand by the wayside and not do anything? Or did he say, things are going to get really bad, but look up because redemption is near. Amen. Okay? That's what he said. It's C. So, let me see a show of hands. How many say it's really tough out there? Good. Should be everybody. everybody. Good. Okay, here's the deal. Since we know it's really tough out there, and the Word of God says it's really tough out there, we need to repent if we're not showing joy about what Jesus said, because it's going to be tough out there. That's transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Submit your body and renew your mind. Submit your body to what's been transformed. What's been transformed? Your dead spirit is now alive. So transform, submit your body to your spirit and renew your mind, soul, right? Your mind is soul. So your body and your soul are aligned with the Spirit. So if your body gets aligned with the Spirit before your mind, will, and emotions do, that's two against one, and your will, your mind, will, and emotions is going to get aligned with your body. Amen. Because you've got you to hop in your step. Because you know what's going on. This is what she's talking about. This is what the Bible's talking about. And in this month, coming up, ER, kind of sounds like Eeyore. Doesn't it? Or ER like emergency room. Okay. But see, a lot of people go, oh, I just I don't know. Go to the ER. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy for Jesus. I'm all in. I don't want what you got. Don't lay your hands on me. Just being honest. And if we catch ourselves like that, you know what you do before somebody tells you? Just repent and go, no, I'm sorry, Lord, because you are all that in a bag of chips and you gave it to me. So I need to reflect it. And when I'm not reflecting it, that's okay. That's when your brother and sister in Christ can go, hey, come here, let's change that outlook you got because what you're sending off does not align with what the Word of God says about what you believe. It's transformation. If you really want to grasp what soul transformation is, get this and all of this. Like, wait, listen, I was in the military. Why do they teach us to do this? Because that, that expresses strength. You want to follow somebody that is like, oh, amen, man, I'm right on. Look at that guy. He's got some strength. I want to follow somebody that's got joy. I don't want to follow somebody like, oh, Christ will give you victory. I mean, do, do, do you get what we're saying? Amen. Amen, amen. Well, for, when Pastor Adam started talking, it, it, there was, I just felt this rise of faith just for a second rise of faith. There was a faith of God moment where, I'm going to just take you there for a second. 
where you know you've been given an assignment for this month. And the assignment is, can you allow God to give you, allow him, where you're, you're drinking his water and you're eating his food and you've laid your heart before him, can you allow God to give you a rise on the inside, a get up and a go with some joy? Because if you can agree with that, then, and keep your eyes on Christ and Christ alone and not what's going on around you, before you know it, 30 days will be up and you wouldn't have even nearly experienced the level of frustration or the level of anxiety that can come when we allow the things of the world to come and overtake us. And so let your faith rise. Let the faith of God come in because your faith of God is when your faith touches his faith. See, he already believes that for us. Are we going to believe that with him? Because then when we do, we can step into it. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 12. Because I said I was going to tie the old in with the new. So the Old Testament is the Passover all the way through those chapters in Exodus until we get to Exodus 19 which starts the reading of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Well, fast forward to Acts chapter 12, and the similar thing is happening only at this time in the New Testament, and it's happening to Peter. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you Peter's desert captive experience and what God did to get him out right at the Passover. Let's read. Acts chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Hmm, kind of sounds like Exodus, huh? Where the Pharaoh had kind of persecuted him. He had James, Herod had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. But when he saw that the that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Well, what happened at the Festival of Unleavened Bread all those years before? That's when they killed the lamb and put it on the doorpost and they hid in the house because they were getting ready to go. What also happened on the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Our Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was persecuted for saying he was the son of God. And so here we have his disciple, Peter, same thing's happening. Do you understand how if you can keep up with the seasons and the times, you can begin to understand what God is doing in the atmosphere? Isn't that cool? Like seriously, that's like the coolest thing ever. If you know the word and you know what's happened to them, don't you think for one second it ain't happening to you. It's getting ready to come. Why? Because God continues to show himself in his word today the same way he did all those years ago. Just teaching you something. After arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but, but, everybody say with me, but, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Come on, say, but church, but church, who's the church? Who's the church? What do you got to do? Ah, good job. The night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial, he was asleep between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Now picture this. Peter is sleeping between the law. He's sleeping between accusers of the brethren. He's sleeping between ones who have come to kill him. And he's what? He's sleeping. He's asleep. But then suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. Debbie and I talked about this today. Because he's resting in the middle of being accused, he's got his eyes on Jesus while the church is covering him in prayer. And then what happens? Again, the angel shows up. Here's another angel. To what? Take him to the place that God prepared for him. And what does the angel do? The angel smites him. 
get up, quick, hits him, smites him. That's what the word says, smite. It's like a sword. It's the same one. Uh, it's the same Greek word that you get when the word says, if you smite the shepherd, the sheep are going to scatter. So he gets smited. Basically, it's a big kick. Wake up. We're going, bud. Quick, get up. And what happens? The chains fall off his wrists. God's come to his rescue. God's broken the chains over his life. But what do we learn from Peter? He's asleep while the church is praying. There's a lot of sleepers in our world today. If the church prays, they might get smited and get up. Get saved, get healed, get delivered, get to church, change your life. But for us, what does that mean for us? As you lay with the accuser of the brethren on either side of you, going to the courtroom in heaven, saying, don't you know? They've been grumbling and complaining, telling lies about you, Lord. Don't you know that? God says, I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to send an angel to take them to the place that I have prepared for them. And so the angel tells them, get yourself together. We're going to get out of here. And then verse 11 says, well, Peter thought it was a vision. He wasn't sure. He was, he was running through the streets, grabbed his cloak, grabbed his shoes, did whatever the angel said, came on out. And then verse 11 says, Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Now, what do we learn from this? In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your chains, even today, God can set you free, set our souls free, as Pastor Adam was talking about, right? Because if you're born again, it's not that your spirit's not free, it's that your soul's in bondage. And your soul's in bondage to the law, it's in bondage to being accused from the enemy. So God can set you free in an instant, if you are in a position of keeping your eyes on him in that private place with him where he's giving you water and he's giving you food and you keep your eyes on him and on nothing else. And then the church prays. You pray and people pray. You tell somebody what you need. Say, pray for me. And as the church prays, you're going to get set free. And when you get set free, then you're going to have a testimony to share about how you had this oppression on you, or it was a difficult desert season, but you kept your eyes on the Lord and refused for an entire month not to look at anything except for seek God for water and for food. And now you're set free. See, the supernatural comes in when we do what God's called us to do. See, the angel coming to release Peter was a supernatural move from God. You want to see the supernatural in your life? Then start asking God for water and food and keep your eyes on him, and you will see the supernatural take place. Why? Because you're dedicated and committed to service unto the Lord no matter what. And so he's going to send supernatural. Supernatural. And supernatural looks a lot of different ways. But he's going to send something supernatural in your life where then you have a testimony. See, Peter had a testimony then. He's like, whoa, you're not going to believe this, but I was in prison. And actually, read the rest of the story. Because everybody was like, what? They even thought when Rhoda saw him, she was lying. There's no way you saw Peter. He's in prison. So you're going to have some people going, no way. That didn't really happen, did it? Wow. And then you know what happens to your faith? It skyrockets. And when your faith skyrockets, then you start to see more miracles, more healings, more amazing supernatural things happen if the band wants to come up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. In John chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, we have Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And he says, 
Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand heavenly things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. In other words, he was saying, even if people see it, sometimes they don't agree with it as truth. But in verse 12, he says, But I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? This verse should shake us all. It should make every single one of us look in the mirror and say, If Jesus could say that to Nicodemus, then am I somebody that is open to heavenly things? Am I somebody that if Jesus came to talk to me about heavenly things and not earthly things, would I understand? Would I be able to grasp it? Would I I have more of a desire for it? If we answer no to that question, then we need to start praying about tapping into heavenly things. You can do that right here, right here on earth. You can tap into heavenly things. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The kingdom of heaven is for now because the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God making manifest on earth. How do we know that? Because when Jesus walked the earth, he brought heaven to earth because he showed love and miracles and healings and the supernatural followed where he was at. And then he gave that to the church of Jesus Christ. He extended that to the disciples and he says, I've given you all authority to go out and be kingdom expanders, to lay hands on the sick and to cast out demons and lepers will be healed, cleansed. So what Jesus did, he extended to the church. Well, we the church, and if we're not hungry for heavenly things, we need to repent. Because Jesus wants his church to walk in heaven on earth. May it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us bring heaven to earth. Can I get an amen? So let me teach you one quick thing. Let me teach you how to tap into heaven in the here and now. Because this month that you're feeling the resistance, you're going to need to get above the resistance. And that comes in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 the word says that there was a great cloud of witnesses yeah there's a cloud of witnesses there's the heavenly spirits that are watching what we're doing there's a cloud of witnesses and the word says throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for you It says us, but it means for you. You have a race that you're marked out for. And how do you do it? Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, or the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. What what is he doing? He's perfecting your faith. See, because when faith increases, then heaven is made manifest. If you want to see the supernatural, you have to have faith and the faith of God to see it. Your faith and God's faith for the supernatural have to come into play. And that doesn't happen looking at the earthly stuff. That doesn't happen looking at your chains or looking at your prison. It happens when you look at him and then he supernaturally releases you from your chains and from your prison. If you want to get set free, then you got to fix your eyes on him and then heaven will show up and get rid of your chains. And then you're going to have a testimony. We know that the only way that we can experience this is because Jesus went to the cross. And because he sent his Holy Spirit, sent the Holy Spirit to come and to live and be on the inside of us. But the Holy Spirit is righteousness, peace, and joy. So when we say we got the Holy Spirit, then we need to be saying we have righteousness, peace in the midst of this desert and joy no matter what and if the holy spirit on the inside of you is not fully activated then you need to be seeking god to have the holy spirit stirred up on the inside of you quicken your soul so you can step into the plan and purpose of god and run the race marked out for you let's everybody stand to our feet in this place